please rise, please, and would Reverend John Anderson please come forward and lead us in the invocation. Thank you. I'm honored to be here on this evening uh, preceding the National Day of Prayer. And uh, we as a church are honored to be in your community for now the 10th year as of next week. Let's bow for prayer. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we are thankful today for you being present here with us. We, um, we acknowledge your presence and, and thank you for it. We pray uh, for this great country of ours, that you would bless this country and that you would prosper her, that you would keep her safe. We thank you for this community in which we live. We thank you for the first responders who keep us safe and we pray for them that in the discharge of their responsibilities, you would give them success and keep them safe. We pray for our teachers on this uh, Teacher Appreciation Week. We pray that you would, uh, you would bless them and visit them with, um, with satisfaction in their jobs and, and success in their educational efforts. We pray for our nation's military. And Heavenly Father, we pray for the mayor and these representatives, and we pray that as they deal with thorny issues that are uh, bigger than many of us care to deal with. We pray that you give them wisdom beyond their experience and help them to make the, the best decision for this community. We make our prayer tonight in the name of Christ, the rock of our salvation. Amen. Amen. Councilman Slacker, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? <clears throat> yes, sir. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Roll call, please. <clears throat> Councilman McIntosh. Yep. Councilwoman Martin. Here. Councilman Slanta. Here. Mayor Nelson. Here. Councilman Simmons. Here. Councilman Gibson. Here. Councilman Longcart. Here. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good, Good evening. evening, Mayor. Nice crowd. Good to see everyone. And uh, right now, let's, uh, let's have uh, public comment on agenda items. Anyone wishing to speak to any matter on the agenda, please come forward at this time. Good evening, good afternoon. Mr. Mayor, lower the mic. Council, I'm here to speak on um, the downtown uh, proposal for the new roadway on Old 41 uh, on your, behalf of the board. And border. your name for the record? Oh, my name is Roger Brunswick. Thank I'm a 23-year resident of uh, Bonita Springs. Very happy to be here. And uh, I'm just very excited about the downtown uh, Old 41 redevelopment and the, and the roadway project that's being undertaken by our city. Um, I represent uh, the Board of Realtors in this matter. And I'm also a realtor myself. And uh, it's, it's an exciting time for, uh, for the city of Bonita. It's an exciting time for uh, everybody that's in this area. Uh, out, even outside the boundaries. As most of you know, because I think you've all been invited, there's a uh, ribbon cutting this uh, coming Saturday for Longitude, which is going to hopefully kickstart uh, the downtown uh, redevelopment district. That's an exciting project, and uh, my company's involved in that. And uh, I just think taking the roadway and the drainage project and the landscaping and the roundabouts just takes it one step further. and. Uh, I commend you for the diligence that you put forth to make this all happen. We've lived here a long time. We've heard a lot of stories. Uh, I mean, everybody's been waiting for something to get started downtown 41. And by gosh, I think this is it finally. And I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Nope. I'm Christine Bowder. I'm the CEO for Bonita Springs Estero Association of Realtors, and I'm also a resident of Bonita Springs. So I'm going to speak to you as a resident. Um, and I, our office is now up um, by um, Tamiami and Old 41. So I came down Old 41 all the way down onto Bonita Beach Road. And the whole time I was thinking, oh my gosh, I can't wait for these new improvements. It is going to be so beautiful. And I know that it's going to be difficult for a few people for a little while, but I guarantee you in five years they're going to say it was their idea. Um, <laughs> and I think it's going to be prosperous for the whole community, and I think that's what government has to do, is to make a decision that benefits the whole community. 
the many and not the few. And I commend you all for all the work you've done. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Uh, yes, Alex Grant, former city councilman, former local planning agency member. Uh, I'm speaking uh, this time on 6G. Uh, my concern is with the pedestrian safety uh, on these roundabouts. Uh, I think what you need to have is the advice of the Florida Highway Patrol uh, homicide, senior homicide investigator concerning roundabouts in tight urban areas because I think you're going to have big problems with pedestrian traffic on both Terry Street and uh, Pennsylvania. I know you want to have a lot of pedestrians out there. Well, pedestrians and cars do not mix very well without strict traffic enforcement and strict signalization. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Mayor, Council, I'm Richard Polina. I live at 10861 Ragsdale Street. Mm -hmm. Been a resident there for 29 years. Uh, I've seen a lot of things happen. I've seen Benita become a city. I've seen uh, dig up all our streets and become put sewers in there, change our water lines. In all that time, traffic seemed to flow properly. And during season, and our season has been very strong this past year, I've never had a problem getting out of Ragsdale with the traffic lights. Never had a problem coming down, up or down Old 41 with the traffic lights. If they seem to be a problem, maybe tweak them a little bit. The only time I've seen roundabouts is when Naples put them in, never put them in on a major road like Old 41 is, is to be. They've been on side streets. They seem to work okay, but big trucks have a problem with them. I'm worried about the fire trucks coming in and out. I'm wondering about the oil delivery trucks at uh, East and West Terry. Um, I'm concerned that if they are put in and they don't seem to work and they become a bust, is there any provision to take them out and go back to where we were? The traffic lights seem to work fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, for your record, my name is Bert Saunders with the Gray Robinson Law Firm. It's been a number of years since I've been up here, and hey, Bert. Uh, it's nice <laughs> to see all of you. Um, I'm representing the Shangri-La uh, Resort, and they have some pretty fantastic plans going forward. It's all a, a, a work in progress. They're not 100% sure what they're going to do, but what they're going to do, I think, is going to be a centerpiece for uh, the downtown redevelopment and development of the city of Bonita Springs. They do have a problem with the uh, project as currently uh, conceived and as uh, laid out on some of the uh, diagrams. They currently have two full access points on Old 41. They need to maintain those. And so uh, I've talked to your staff. Uh, we're going to be continuing to work with your staff, but I would hope that all of you would consider the importance of having, uh, permitting them to continue to have two full egress and ingress uh, points on uh, 041. Uh, they certainly, the, the plan that you have right now uh, would result in one of those points being closed completely and the other point becoming only a right in and right out. And that would be very, very detrimental to uh, their operations. Uh, also, the plan shows for an access point for them on Kentucky Street. Uh, the problem with that is that for them to develop an access point there, they would lose almost all of their internal parking which again is, is something that they, they simply cannot do. So my re request is uh, to keep those two access points on Old 41. They can be moved around a little bit, but to keep them open. That would require moving the median or having a median cut uh, on one of those uh, points. And again, I'll work with your staff to see if we can make that happen. So again, thank you for your courtesy and look forward to continuing to work with you and your staff. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Rex Sims, 275-25-041 Road. And 
we're having a little celebration today because 30 years ago this very day we opened for businesses heaven sent flowers if i know how much work it was going to be i'd have gone in the real estate business <laughs> We're, uh, Wait a minute. Let's get something clear. You did go into real estate business. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we're excited about this new plan. We you know we've been through a lot of it in the 30 years we've been here, and we're excited to see some activity in this core area. Uh, we're not sure about the mixed use, but we're interested in the parking and the surface water management, and the new uh, interest in the business development in the area. Um, our concerns. <clears throat> Uh, about our drive access and our left turn uh, exit has been guaranteed by the city and the contractor at a public meeting. So uh, that's past us now. But we ask you to consider one option uh, that has not been presented by this contractor. And that is at Pennsylvania and Old 41, we finish the intersection with pavers uh, to create a, a beauty spot like they show on the plan except retain the lights. The reason is explained in the uh, DOT folder about breaks in traffic, which will come from traffic signals downstream. We do not have any. Our traffic signals are at Beach Road and Rosemary. So the Beach Road light and the Rosemary light, each over a half a mile away, will not cause breaks in the traffic by the time it gets to Pennsylvania. Um, Access to business, pedestrian crossing, bicycle riders all require regular brakes in the traffic flow. Ours will move along at a steady 20 mile an hour with no regular brakes. Remember, school kids in the morning, uh, middle school kids in the afternoon. Please consider this as an option for the safety of the intersection. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Rex. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Caitlin Weber here on behalf of the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. I would like to speak to item 12B, the oil and gas ordinance. Uh, the Conservancy is here to express our support for City Council's efforts to manage the use of hydraulic fracturing and other well stimulation techniques within its jurisdiction. We strongly support your efforts and would like to provide the following suggestions. In the green sheet, it outlines the council's desire for an anti-fracking ordinance. The most important thing we've learned from the Hogan Well is that in Florida, there are fracking-like techniques in addition to fracking that are being used that also involve the injection of the same toxic chemicals underground. So we recommend that the ordinance use the broader technical term of well stimulation treatments to capture the spectrum of fracking and fracking-like techniques that use those chemicals. The current proposed ordinance was prepared to set forth standards to obtain council approval of drilling permits rather than the ban, as at the time the green sheet was prepared, there were oil and gas bills moving through the legislature. However, those bills did not pass. And given this, the Conservancy recommends that the city revisit preparing an anti-well stimulation ordinance. This would be the most effective and only legally enforceable way for the city to manage this activity, as current oil and gas laws do not require a permit for well stimulation, and so it would not be possible for the city to track or approve well stimulation through the current permitting process. Under current state law, fracking and other chemical treatments are considered a workover operation and are not a permitted activity. Instead, these activities only require that notification be provided to the state. Also, workovers can be deemed a trade secret by the driller, keeping them from being disclosed to local governments and the public. Therefore, the city would have no ability or legal hook to stop such activities short of passing a local ban. Therefore, we recommend the city revise the ordinance header to include a prohibition of well stimulation treatments. We've provided you with the revised language in the letter we sent yesterday and uh, in a handout I'd like to provide today. Um, and if I could just quickly read through that language. Uh, it's an ordinance requiring approval by Bonita Springs City Council for any permit to drill a oil or gas well, adopting a prohibition on well stimulation treatments such as fracking, providing for conflict, providing for codification, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. With this revision, the Conservancy strongly supports the revised ordinance be advertised. And we thank you for your consideration of our comments. And we hope to be a resource to you in your efforts to ensure that future drilling is done in a manner protective of public health and water supplies in Bonita Springs. Thank you. Thank you. If you wanted to give a copy of that to the city attorney, you could go ahead. Absolutely. You, want to. Okay. you got one? Okay. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. Dennis Church. Hey, Dennis. 
I'm uh, here speaking in support of the item 6G old 41 improvements. Uh, I am in support of the design generally as, as presented. I actually saw a very detailed presentation recently and you should be impressed with your staff and with your team of consultants that have put together a comprehensive and detailed solution that meets the goals of, of the redevelopment project. It also meets the goals of the CRA funding mechanism, which we're already down that road. We've approved the CRA funding, and, and these improvements are critical in their totality to make the CRA work. That mechanism assumes increased property values. It assumes new development, and these improvements as designed set the stage for that. And I can't predict the economic success but I have studied these types of developments throughout Florida and visited them throughout the, the United States. And these guys got it right. They've got the right pieces. They didn't just make it up. They have great examples of the individual components from the medians to the design of the roundabouts to the on-street parking to the pedestrian space in front of the future retail. So I would say that you may have objections to certain components to the roundabout, for example. But I would stress that this is a comprehensive design and each of the pieces build on each other to make it successful. So I'm asking you to support the entire project. Don't be tempted to take pieces out, which would weaken the overall chances of success. Our community deserves this in its totality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please come forward. Fred Mosser, Benita Springs, 9380 Lake Abbey Lane. Uh, I went to the March 30 meeting, I believe that was, and expressed myself about a missing key component in this entire project. And the key component that I addressed to the individuals there. Was an additional brief we, we won't be able to hear you on the record there. Yeah, point that out and then come on back. There you go. Right. Thank you very much, sir. I believe, again, you're missing that key component, and that is a bridge, an additional bridge over uh, the Imperial River. And you were, I, you were motioning between Center Street and... Uh, yeah, I was going to, yeah. uh, yes, Mayor, I was going to address that. Good. Center Thank Avenue, you. I guess it is Center yeah, there you go. Avenue, and Feltz Avenue. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's, that's my concern that I think the uh, council and uh, everyone that's going to vote on this should consider that bridge. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Fred Forbes, I want to support the uh, Conservancy's recommendation to modify that fracking ordinance as they propose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else this time, please come forward. Hello. I'm Susie Sager, um, owner of Heaven Sent Flowers and For Heaven Shakes Ice Cream, um, located on the corner of Old 41 in Ragsdale. And yeah, today's our 30th anniversary, and I'm supposed to be back out there making Mother's Day flowers right now, but this is really important for us. I just want everybody to know that we're really excited. This is really a, an absolute fun thing that we're getting ready to do, and we hope that this time, the end result that we seek is more businesses coming to the corridor, and it'll be a success. Along with those businesses is the hope of more people paying customers to come also. I've been talking to my customers, both at the flower shop and on the ice cream side, and have been told repeatedly that they're not in favor of roundabouts. Um, they don't like them. They're intimidated by them. Um, customers from the north report all of the negative aspects that the roundabouts have brought to their communities there, as well as reports of people just shopping someplace else because they don't want to have to deal with roundabouts. They're in their cities, but they just go someplace else, and it's too easy to do that. It's why should we inconvenience people to go through navigating a section of town that's not friendly for them to drive and to shop and to park and to spend their money where we want them to be? These are statements from my paying customers, not statistics from other communities. These are people that I've actually talked to and have hundreds of people since February have been trying to do this. It makes it too easy for them to buy flowers, tuxedos, gifts, and ice creams in other part of the town. They'll just go somewhere else. This concerns me very much. If my customers aren't willing to drive to a destination just because of how the streets are laid out, 
then it calls it to my attention that this needs to be changed. My wish to you is we continue on the planned route of beautifying the corner with decorative pavers, low landscaping, underground utilities, and maybe a decorative traffic lights that will continue to stop the traffic in all four directions, allow the pedestrians and the children coming to and from our local schools to safely cross with lights, and remove any planned medians from all four sides so traffic, including the fire and safety equipment, can move freely through that intersection. Since I am the only two businesses on the corners involved, um, I hope you understand our situation and vote to take another look at the issues and the ideas that have been addressed tonight. I thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else this time, please come forward on any agenda item. Mr. Mayor, Council, John Pano, CGT Kayaks. Um, I'm proud to say I'm a historic downtown merchant. Um, and this will directly affect, uh, I'm sorry, I got to say what I'm talking about. Um, item six, um, the downtown improvements will directly uh, affect my business down there. Uh, I'm not sure about the roundabouts. Um, the jury's still out on those. Uh, I am very, very impressed though by the way the city staff and the city has worked with the downtown merchants to work out their differences and their issues. Uh, and that's all I have to really say about that. Uh, the next uh, is item uh, 11, or I'm sorry, 13, uh, on the, uh, uh, the manager's report uh, regard, uh, item A, uh, discussing the commercial and recreational uh, mobile vendors' um, access to the waters and the parks. Um, I can only, again, commend the city and the staff for putting together a very comprehensive plan um, that deals with this very important issue because this industry is growing so fast. Um, it is important now more than ever uh, to stay on top of it. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you again. Thank you very much, John. Uh, anyone else uh, like to speak on any agenda item? Please come forward. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Shelly Anderson, and I'm here to speak in favor of the downtown redevelopment. I'm speaking as a 37-year resident of Bonita Springs. I live right off of Old 41, across from the Wonder Gardens. And I'm also speaking as a board member of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I've been involved in uh, meetings, the, the um, public um, presentations. I was at a meeting this morning at the Chamber uh, regarding the plan. I had some concerns in the beginning. Um, they have made some changes. I think they've really listened to the public and, and what the changes are that we were looking for. Um, I had concerns about the roundabouts. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but this gentleman right here has really convinced me with all of his work that he's done apparently all over the world with roundabouts and the studies that he's done that, that they really will work. So I'm convinced. Um, I think a lot of work has gone into this by, by the city, the staff, um, all the people involved back here have just done a fabulous job. And as a longtime resident of Benita, I'm very excited and I want it to get started right away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelley. Anyone else this time on any agenda item, please come forward. No? No? Oh, here he comes. Come on up. Eh, take your time. We got all night. Council, Mayor, uh, my name is Anthony Mancillo. I am not a resident of this town. I came to this town because you're doing a redevelopment, and I've done a number of them since 77. Um, I, I first off, I can't believe how nice everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Try doing this in New York or Boston or you know, the suburb cities there. But anyways, I have seen more compromise and more goodwill. The engineers are fantastic. They, they just feel question after question, even though many times they're the same questions over and over again. I uh, have not been a businessman in downtown Benita, although I did live here for a long time on Avonlea Drive. But I have acquired about three and a half acres uh, of the downtown land and I'm about to acquire about another two and a half acres. I are trying to build up about 10 acres of land in downtown Benita because we really believe it's gonna happen. And we're paying cash for this land, so we wouldn't be doing it if we didn't believe it was gonna happen. 
Um, we think the plan is wonderful, but I do have some problems with them. I can live with roundabouts. I lived, the, I lived with them in New Jersey. I did the Tom's River Shopping Center. <clears throat> and Tom's River has roundabouts, and I don't like them, but they work. But I don't like the center island, the median. I don't like the idea where, this is an urbanistic type of development, okay? And when you're doing an urbanistic type of development, I realize you can't do it just for the people who are here now, even though they own the city, but you have to do it for prosperity as well. Now, thinking about that, the big thing for, to make the downtown a success is can we draw in the proper tenants for downtown? And I'm not saying the tenants that are already there are not the proper tenants. There are just more tenants and more buildings to come. Now, if you want to draw in those proper tenants, you have to consider what their needs are. And one of their needs is accessibility to their restaurant or their doctor's office or whatever they're putting there. Okay, And the idea of having a two-lane road with a divider in it in an urbanistic setting just don't, I can't make sense out of that. Now, a guy's driving through town, and the kids say, Daddy, there's ice cream over there. And he says, yeah, but I can't take a left. We'll go to the next place. Because we're all lazy, you know? The, it, the town should be accessible. It's, the, the plan is important to incorporate accessibility by car, by pedestrian, by bicycle, and everybody safely. Also, I think they're taking a little too much out of the roads to put that in because it's tight to begin with, especially since we're going to parallel parking. Whoops, there goes my door. You know, you know, you got to be thinking of those things. And I realize that there's uh, open space problems and beautification problems. But when I did downtown Providence with Duaney, one of the things that he said, which I still believe in, is that the street should be an open scape. And, and the towns, we were talking about what the height restriction should be. And he said, the height restriction should be half of the distance from the center with a clear view across. So to give it a sense of place and purpose. Okay, and I still think, and by the way, I was talking to, about Mrs. Duaney, not the salesman. <laughs> um, th and that's so important because that you is what makes you feel comfortable and secure when you're in a place, that you that's created by the street. Once you chop that you down the middle and stop putting trees and stuff in there, you're cutting out visibility to the, to the current businesses and the future businesses. You're, you're, you're making people make U-turns all over the place. I'm not a genius. I'm not an engineer. I'm not as bright as these guys, but I don't like them. They don't work, and I wanted you to know that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, brother. All right, anybody else at this time on any agenda item, please come forward. Seeing none, we'll close public comment, and we will go to proclamations and presentations. And thank you, everybody, for your comments. Really well done, nicely done. Uh, at this time, let me see if we can get it together here. Not we, me. Okay, at this time we have a proclamation here. Uh, Janet Martin and Nicole Perino, we're going to present this to you. Why don't you walk around here? Nicole. All right, and this is a proclamation I'm supposed to present to you two right here. I'm gonna keep everybody in suspense on what it is. I don't know yet until I read it. That's how good I do my homework. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, whereas for more than a century, the bicycle has been an important part of the lives of most Americans. And whereas today millions of Americans engage in bicycling as an environmentally sound form of transportation, an excellent form of fitness and quality family recreation. And whereas the education of cyclists and motorists as to the proper and safe operation of bicycles is important to ensure the safety and comfort of all users. And whereas since 2000, bike community has grown by 62% with 864,883, that's pretty exact, <laughs> bike commuters. And whereas, that's probably changed by now, right? Yeah. And whereas the League of American Bicyclists and Independent Cyclists throughout our state are promoting great public awareness of bicycle operation and safety education in an effort to reduce accidents injuries and fatalities for all. Now, therefore, I, Ben Nelson, Mayor of the City of Indian Springs, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2016 as National Bike Month, and throughout the city, and encourage all citizens to recognize the importance of bicycle safety and to be more aware of all the bicyclists on our streets. 
And these two here are really working hard to make that happen for everybody. Please give them a hand. Thank you so much. Uh, would Major Timothy and Cheryl Gillian please come forward? This is for National Salvation Army Week. You probably guessed that. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? Welcome. Uh, this is a proclamation from the city of Benita Springs. Whereas the love for God and the desire to help others is the motivation behind the men and women of the Salvation Army. And whereas the Salvation Army in the city of Benita Springs, Florida, provides comprehensive programs and services to individuals and families experiencing homelessness, poverty, addiction, illness, and injury. And whereas the Salvation Army serves as both a symbol of compassion and as an active participant in the providing of services to thousands of Benita Springs men, women, and children. And whereas the Salvation Army has been providing these programs to residents for 64 years. And whereas 2015 marks the 150th anniversary of the Salvation Army, and whereas the Salvation Army provides its services to people in need without regard to race, color, creed, sex, or age. Now, therefore, I, Ben Nelson, Jr., Mayor of the City of Indian Springs, do hereby proclaim the week of May 11th through 17th, 2015, as National Salvation <laughs> Army Week, and urge all citizens to join me in honoring these dedicated men and women who work for and volunteer for this fine organization that touched the lives of so many. Please give them a hand on behalf of the city. Thank you so much. Just want to say thank you. We enjoy being a neighbor and a community partner. And as the mayor has already said, we're celebrating 150 years of service this year, and then Lee County 64 years. We look to expand our services and programs, and we look forward to the next 150 years and uh, being uh, even better partners and neighbors in Benita Springs. Thank you. Thank you so much. We get up. We, we, no. What? 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 Uh, 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 no, oh, this is public works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, but we oh, I got it. Missed him. Me. Me. What about the? I got it. <laughs> <coughs> uh, let's see. We got a Florida Bicycle <laughs> Sickle Association wants to give an award to somebody, and we have a bike advocate who is going to do the presentation. Would you come forward, please? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I actually have your name. I saw it. Watch, oh, come on around here. Come on. <laughs> Darn, I would like the. Your <laughs> <laughs> name's Becky, right? Becky Afonso? Yes. This is Becky Afonso. Oh, Becky. Hi, Becky. Huh? Oh, <laughs> hey. Hi. How you doing? Mayor, Good. Good. You. Here you go. Mayor, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Mayor and Council, it's an honor to be here after the proclamation for Bike Month. Yeah, cool. Becky Afonso, 250 Strathmore Avenue, Oldsmar, Florida. That's Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. I came down for a very specific reason. And that is, the Florida Bicycle Association annually recognizes people, agencies, and organizations from around the state for their contributions in helping to create a bicycle-friendly Florida. In your very community, you have just an ordinary citizen by the name of Ryan Schofield, who chose to take up bicycling for health reasons, if I'm not mistaken, and commutes to work on a regular basis. Now, you may or may not have heard of him because he's a bit of a social media YouTube phenomenon. He has adapted like GoPro you. videos onto his bicycle in an effort to show some of his experiences while just commuting to work. He's been pulled over by law enforcement claiming he's not where he needs to be on the road, that he should be on a sidewalk. More recently, he had a white pickup truck pass him, stop right in front of him. That motorist got out of that vehicle and started yelling at him for where he was riding his bike. What caught my attention through both of those videos is the calm demeanor that Ryan portrays throughout all of this. 
I myself saw that last video as a rather life-threatening experience just for someone trying to get to work. But Ryan is a calm, cool and collected individual. I like to think the bicycling helps with that. Okay, in fact, there's proven studies on the health benefits, the productivity benefits, not to mention some money savings that can happen with riding a bicycle. But when you're out there and you get those endorphins going and you get motorists that yell at you, throw things at you, you can smile. You really can. Because for the most part, bicycling puts you in a better place. And bicycling helps communities put the community in a better place. Now I know Ryan's got his stories of GoPro video escapades, his background which was uh, health reasons for taking up bicycling. But for the most part, he has self-taught himself cycling etiquette through a program that developed from the Florida Bicycle Association called Cycling Savvy. And even though everybody has their opinion, it's proven that when cyclists ride in certain ways on the road, they fare better. It's not the right-hand curb. It's in the lane a little bit. Let a motorist see you. It's also being courteous to motorists, and Ryan gets that. He dresses visibly. He signals. And he's courteous to drivers making eye contact or even I, I don't know if you've ever really had that happen with traffic backup where you would pull over and let, release. It's called just let them go and then get back on the bike and ride. Uh, he's done that on his own, and I will say after how many years and how many miles he stands or he will be standing here shortly as proof that it doesn't get you killed. He's a survivor and a testament as a citizen to be an advocate for what safe cycling is and what our association supports. So it is my honor this evening in the city of Bonita Springs to award Ryan our 2014 Citizen Advocate of the Year. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for coming out. Oh, wait, from Tampa, huh? Yeah. Tampa, so did you ride a bike? Yeah. You didn't ride a bike, did you? No, but I want to get back to the lightning game. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're the only one. <laughs> now you're. Uh, to come on up here. Come on up here. Personally. Oh. Um, for uh, bike to week work. Yeah. And uh, culminating in, in, the, in the Friday, and I would like to invite you to uh, bike to City Hall that day. Okay. <laughs> right. I know. Uh, at the last uh, bicycle pedestrian meeting, everyone kind of got a chuckle about the idea that anybody, you know, in city council or the mayor would, would ride their bike to work. But I'm uh, I'm here to uh, if, if I can ride with you on the weekend. If you want to, uh, I can plan out your route or anything. I can I can help. You're gonna have trouble keeping up with them. <laughs> I'll do it. All right. Awesome. Family went. We awesome. Yeah. We're ready for this awesome. one. But uh, no GoPro on mine, okay? Because I don't. Nobody wants to see that. Camera off the record. No. Yeah. <laughs> Ready? All right. Right here, Matt Feeney. Yeah, I got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Matt Feeney. Oh, would you come up here, please? Before we beat the tar out of you in front of everybody with this big map right here, we're going to – we always give awards to people before we have our way with them. Matt, our public works director, and he's doing – you're doing a great job. Everybody give him a hand. He's doing an awesome job. Really well done. I, That's a matter of opinion. I, I know us pretty well. I don't, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you put For up with Navy this. For a Navy guy? Oh, gosh. All right. Whereas public work services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public work systems and programs such as landscape installation, maintenance, road construction maintenance, stormwater management, right-of-way and driveway permitting, and whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these 
facilities as well as their planning, design, and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of our public's work officials. And whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the public's attitude. You wrote this, didn't you? <laughs> and understanding of the importance of the work that they perform. Now, therefore, I've been Nelson Jr., Mayor of the City of Benita Springs, Florida, do proclaim the week of May 17th through May 23rd, 2015, as National Public Works Week and call upon all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, and comfort, and quality of life. Matt, thank you so much for everything that you do. Please give it a hand. Public work still needs to show up for work that week. Oh, no. <laughs> right, Matt. That doesn't mean you can be off that week, okay? <laughs> or any, any week, as a matter of fact. Okay, where are we at now? Matt, you want to give us an update on the trees? <laughs> okay, we are at item E. Uh, let's see. Now we have... I Whoa! <laughs> We're ready. We're ready for it. Oh, that's like magic. <laughs> Hi. What do you... Hi. I'm the communications manager for the city of Benita Springs. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about the 2014-2015 event season. Wow, what a season we had. We saw growth in most of our city events with our 4th of July event increasing uh, attendance to 10,000 patrons for the firework finale. That's pretty amazing. The event permits have also increased this season with the city issuing 60 special event permits the successful season is attributed to a dedicated community effort through multiple agencies. We will show you a brief recap video highlighting the 2014-2015 season, but first I'd like Community Relations Specialist Joanne Lawrence to speak about the growth uh, that our cleanup events and our movies experienced, followed by our Special Event Community Chair Bobby Bird and Benita Assistance Office Representative Marjorie Johnson. Joanne Lawrence, Community Relations Specialist for the City. Um, most Venetians are aware of our larger public events, but we do have several smaller events that the community really enjoys and that have seen uh, exponential growth actually this past year. And my favorite personally of these are the cleanups. Um, the beach cleanup, for instance, had four times as much trash collection. So we collected 3,500 pounds of trash that day on the beach, even in the water this year as well by land and sea. And we had twice as many volunteers. So we had about 850 volunteers and collected 2,500 pounds more trash than the year before. So it was quite a huge thing I think we did. And then the, um, the city cleanup also had a record turnout of volunteers, 150 more volunteers. Um, and the movie in the park series has grown, added new dimensions to it. Um, our favorite this year was Frozen, which had probably double the attendance of any movie we've had. Um, we had live characters, city staff, as you know, my colleagues. Uh, sacrificed themselves and became frozen characters really kindly um, it was lots of fun and um, we added carriage rides games free face painting all the movies had live characters face painting and, and so forth so we're really really thankful to the community organizations that partnered with us and all the volunteers thank you thank you very much nice, nice job Joan. my name is bobby bird i'm a bonita resident um, as both a, um, representing both a sponsor with American House and the Rotary Club, and as a volunteer with the Special Events Committee, I want to thank Council and Mayor for your support of these events. I especially want to thank the committee and all our volunteers and the businesses who have donated goods and services, but most importantly, volunteer hours. During the uh, budget process, Council looks at staff hours. It's appropriate. What they don't see are the volunteer hours. I'll let Marjorie speak on behalf of the Benita Springs Assistance Office, but we've enjoyed an increase in volunteer hours as well as an increase in, in attendance at these events. Uh, we estimate conservatively 
that we had about 2,200 volunteer hours for just the four city-sponsored events. That doesn't include the other, all the other 56 special permits that were pulled that probably had volunteers as well. Those four events are July 4th, Riverfest, Holiday in the Park, and our largest production is Celebrate Bonita. Again, Marjorie will talk about the benefits of Celebrate Bonita directly. But we want to thank the council for supporting us um, emotionally and monetarily in being able to provide this lifestyle and this kind of event for our people. We had zero incidents at Celebrate Bonita with an estimated crowd of over 8,500 people. Zero. That's awesome. And that just goes to prove that not only are we making the right decision by putting on these uh, events, but that the community is, is behind it, the, f the public safety is behind it, public works is behind it. We're all in this together, and it's working. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Marjorie. And last but not least. <laughs> Let me move this up a little bit. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come here because I have a few things I'd like to say about uh, what has happened for our organization because of the partnership. 37 years ago, um, led by Father Foley, a group of forward-thinking residents came together to form the Benita Springs Assistance Office. And when the Benita Springs area became official, and as we are all here and we're celebrating that, Everyone decided to continue to support that organization, especially through the city and the participation with events as well as people who work for the city and are involved in the city. When we have the opportunity every year to partner with the, the city for Celebrate Bonita, it is a unique opportunity for us and for many other organizations that benefit because we receive financial resources that we would not be able to have access to from people making donations or purchasing items but we also receive a platform to talk about what we are trying to accomplish as an organization and I want to applaud you and I want to applaud the city as well as the residents for the opportunity for us to enjoy events as well as organizations like mine to benefit from those events and as I can sit here and and, and say I can notice all of you that are out there at all of these events either talking with people or actually volunteering your time and because of that Bonita Springs is a better place for these events as well as the support and for the close to 1900 families that my organization touched last year through food and financial assistance through 43,000 pounds of food as well as the financial resources these partnerships allow us to help people in Bonita Springs who are otherwise in a position where they could not help themselves through no fault of their own. And as we can all recollect and realize that it is very difficult for any of us in this room to say we have never known anyone who has been in a position where they could not help themselves. We can all say that. It could be because someone has fallen and broken their hip, or they've been diagnosed with something, or they lost their job, or the real estate boom that we all experience but it happens and because of the partnership and the forward thinking that has continued throughout all of these 37 years we're able to continue with the work that we do so thank you very much for that opportunity and I look forward to more opportunities like this happening for all of us here in Benita Springs as someone who works here and someone who's lived here for 13 years so thank you thank you for what you do thank you Marjorie. thank you very much yeah and now action uh, you want Want to get the lights? Please. Yes.
That was fun. It's on our, it's on our website. Let's do that again. again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. You can go on home now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, listen, uh, these are these are the kind of events that we, we we could tell from the very beginning when the city started that these this was the glue that was going to hold our community together. It, it really bonded us. Everything that we do at that park, it just brings us up closer together. So thank you, all, all you volunteers. And Patrick, I want you to stand up for a second. I want to see that guy and say, look at this oh, guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> look at this guy. Uh, looking good. Still not, still not my type. <laughs> looking real good. <laughs> Be glad. Be glad. Anyway, uh, nicely done. And Laura and everyone, thank you so much. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Here we go now. Uh, 
Let's see, we are going to have a presentation from the South Lee County Advocate, Larry Newell. Larry, are you prepared to uh, give a presentation? Why don't you come on up here? Thank you very much. My name is Larry Newell uh, uh, from uh, the, the land up north. Uh, I would like to present to you a challenge today, and I have had the fortunate of having Bill Onkart lending me his ear, uh, and I deeply appreciate it. I think to put together something like this to continue Bonita Springs. Uh, ben, as I recall, about two years ago, you were kind enough to invite me to your business office uh, to discuss the future of the enterprise of Bonita and Estero, South Lee County. Uh, I would like to pick up from that that one of the issues that I felt so important was the cornerstone of this could be a full service hospital. That now has been put in jeopardy by two hospitals that decided to go to war against each other. Uh, you have all this information I have sent to you, all, each one of you, I think uh, my last two, laying out the challenge that we have as a community to supersede government regulation that got out of control that permitted, uh, timid, permitted um, the state agency for health care administration to deny the application on the part of Lee Memorial to establish the hospital uh, and, and uh, as a result uh, still followed the administrative law judge. A little point of order here of notice. I received two phone calls uh, uh, at, at that time, circa that time, uh, one was from the chairman of the board of Lee Memorial Health Systems and the other one was from a Tallahassee attorney representing Lee Memorial, both of which pleaded with me not to try to intervene in the administrative law judge because I had intended to do this to show to the administrative law judge that we're dealing with flawed government regulation, regulation that does not listen to what needs to be done, they pit two hospitals against each other and forget about, totally oblivious to what it's doing to the concept that I sat down with Ben sometime before and, and, and Stephen, as I recall, you and I discussed this briefly when we met. Uh, let's try to take the high road here and I could like to do this by issue of that this country cannot afford discrimination no matter where it comes from what form it takes, who administers it, uh, whether it is race, whether it is uh, gender, whether it is social economic status, these things must be removed forever. I bring this up because I am concerned that the actions of two hospitals have forgotten this lesson. Uh, I remember uh, watching the, the, you probably were glued to it like I was, Baltimore, uh, in which Elijah Cummings, Demo uh, I shouldn't be Democrat, he, he was a Democrat, a uh, uh, representative from, uh, from Maryland, uh, who in interviewed on CON, his, his face was streamed with tears of what, what these riots had done. Uh, and then came along this black mother who decided to slap her hooded kid around the streets for about 10, 15 minutes, that to me was iconic. It set the stage. Uh, I don't want to see the same thing or similar things. I know I'm, I'm not precisely, I'm not talking. Race was not the only issue in Baltimore. It was poverty. It was uh, discrimination from every vantage point you can imagine. Uh, what I would like to propose is that, that uh, incidentally, I, I would like to uh, pay notice to that there is a lovely lady behind me sitting back in the back. Uh, her name is uh, Katie Arrington, who also is on the city, of, uh, city Council of Estero that I believe shares my concerns about this hospital. I would like to see a merger between the C City Council of Benita and the City Council of Estero to move forward and negotiate with, with Lee Memorial Health System on how to overcome a major problem. Lee Memorial has decided to put all of its cookies behind the establishment, expansion of 
the Gulf Coast Hospital. There are some in Estero who have pushed this idea uh, and have, however, tripped a little bit because Lee Memorial has come up with what they call a medical village, which is a darn good idea, but a medical village without being connected to a full service hospital does not cut it. It must be, a, we in Benita, we in Estero need to have the right of having the best possible delivery system. You will not get it just by a medical village. It has to be combined between, between, between a hospital, full service hospital. Because if this expansion program in com is complete, it sets up a 624 bed hospital at Gulf Coast. If that happens, the hospital for Estero is dead forever. Uh, what I'm hopeful is that through the power and the support of the Benita City Council and the Estero City Council that we can convince Mr. Nathan and the chairman of the board. One thing that um, I, th it kind of, well, I think I told you about early is uh, uh, I received those two phone calls. And one, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, I received by accident, unintentionally, an email was meant for Jim Nathan of the, of the Lee Memorial Health System, the CEO, from the chairman of the board. Uh, its comment was misdirecting it to me by mistake. When Larry gets the steam up, you cannot stop him. So I'm here uh, to try to say, yeah, you can stop me if you wish, because, but I'm counting on you as the, as the Benita City Council to follow my, I can discuss this later, I don't think I need to get into the specifics of this, Mayor, uh, but I have an idea in my mind, it precisely approach we should take, and I would certainly like to participate under your leadership. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, now, uh, I think what everybody's been waiting for, for a lot of people have been waiting for, we have a presentation of the results of the Downtown Improvement Project, the 60% plan. Matt, oh, and uh, by the way, Carl, would you like to kick this off for us, yes, please? Yes, I would, thank you. Matt, you can stand there. <laughs> um, I just want to, first off, take you back about four years when I started here, and four years ago, and one of, one of my goals as city manager set up by city council at that time was to revitalize the downtown. And we have gone through uh, a lot of work, a lot of hours uh, to get to where we are actually tonight. Um, that included putting in place a very unique um, and likely not to be repeated um, funding uh, sharing, a revenue sharing program with Lee County, uh, who is our partner uh, in, this, in this project. Uh, and we are also here tonight with the design and after many hours of meetings with our residents and our business people and our property owners, we have a design that we believe makes sense. It is bold, um, it creates change and it, we think it creates the change needed um, to drive the downtown to the next level. Now we haven't been able, and you've heard it tonight, we haven't been able to accommodate um, all of the concerns of all the businesses but we've worked very hard to accommodate those we could. Uh, and so we are here tonight to give you your final presentation um, with Matt starting off with an introduction and then allowing the consultants to provide the rest of that presentation. Um, but at the end of the presentation, we're going to ask council for approval of 60% plans, which is where we're at tonight, which would then automatically move us to 90% in terms of design and will also trigger the creation of an all important number, which is our guaranteed maximum price on this project. So that's all very important um, and just want you to know kind of what we're looking for at the end of these presentations this tonight. And with for, uh, no further more ado, I'd like to introduce Matt Feeney, the man of the hour, the public works director. Um, Go ahead. I, my name is Matt Feeney, <laughs> Public Works Director. Um, Carl hit on a lot of the points, but I, I thought I would just uh, 
just refresh everyone's memory as to where we are in this process and what we'd be asking for tonight and some of the actions that we've taken uh, to get there. Um, we really started in earnest um, with the right construction design build team uh, late in the fall or around Thanksgiving time frame uh, working on a, a design for the downtown project that uh, did several things uh, but essentially created a destination downtown uh, but that was accommodating to the existing traffic patterns that we have <clears throat> created an environment conducive for redevelopment uh, as well as uh, the existing development uh, in terms of improvements to parking, increases in parking, uh, increases to stormwater treatment so that new businesses would not have to take up precious landscape uh, for stormwater treatment, as well as a, a safer pedestrian uh, and bicyclist, a multimodal environment. Uh, to that end, uh, the team worked within the confines primarily of our 70-foot right-of-way in the downtown. So they, they, they colored within the lines and uh, came to the conclusion uh, of the design that you see before you. Uh, back in January, at the end of January, we held a 30% design workshop that was well attended by about 86 members of the general public. Uh, we received feedback, incorporated some of those changes that were uh, advocated for from, from the comments we received at the workshop as well as individual meetings that uh, uh, were scheduled thereafter. Uh, we modified the design and we came back to the public on March 31st for a 60% design review. Uh, from that design, uh, from at that meeting, we actually had better out outcome. We had about 105 folks from the general public come. We received more comments. Uh, we scheduled more meetings. And myself and the development services director, Arlene Hunter, actually walked the corridor, and invited each and every business that we could uh, to come for, for one more opportunity to meet with the folks from Wright Construction to voice any individual concerns with their property to see if there were some design uh, modifications that could be made uh, to accommodate their needs. Uh, we held meetings uh, with about 15 property owners uh, at the end of April, and we've incorporated uh, the, the components that we could to the design, and what you see before you is the 60% design as it was at the public input workshop on the bottom. Uh, and the modified 60% design above, which is what we would be seeking tonight approval from City Council for. Uh, the reason we're seeking approval, as Carl mentioned, is to be able to finalize uh, cost estimates on the project. Uh, the next step is to move towards construction, which is what the guaranteed maximum price is. It's the critical component of a design-build process. It's, it's the guaranteed goods and services at a ceiling price that our general contractor would then be held accountable for and it allows dirt to start turning on the project. We anticipate uh, pending a council approval of the design before you uh, being able to come back in June time frame with that guaranteed maximum price for your consideration uh, and again uh, assuming approval at some point in June uh, construction to start soon thereafter uh, possibly by July. Uh, without further ado, <laughs> to steal Carl's line, I'd like to introduce Andy Powell from the Wright Construction Team. He is one of several Powells that work at the Wright Construction Team. Uh, I've been working primarily with Jim Powell in the design phase, but uh, Andy's going to lead us through a brief overview presentation of what we found from our 60% input uh, meeting, as well as from the individual meetings that were, came thereafter. Uh, so, Andy. Well, good evening, good evening, everyone. Again, my name's Andy Powell. I'm with Wright Construction. Uh, I'm going to let, uh, we've got several members here to present tonight, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves or as they come up as opposed to taking up a lot of time right now. Uh, first of all, from, from our perspective, we understand that this is an economic development project, redevelopment project, and in that uh, perspective, We've always maintained the goals of the project, which I'll briefly go through, which is to create area-wide drainage improvements, undergrounding the overhead utilities along old US 41, opening up the Imperial River and Oak Creek views and bringing in, bringing in those uh, natural aspects of the project uh, to enhance the project, uh, creating a pedestrian-friendly streetscape, a complete street, 
Uh, that'll be addressed by the consultants in just a few minutes and also in providing that additional downtown parking uh, that Matt was speaking to. Uh, the purpose of this presentation, Matt went through, I won't go be redundant with that, but what we're seeking is approval to move from the 60 to the 90% plans, bring back a guaranteed maximum price and for your approval uh, sometime in June. Uh, as we stand, the 60% design documents uh, maintains the vision of creating a destination for downtown. Uh, it enhances those natural assets of, that I addressed before, the Imperial River and Oak Creek. It improves water quality that Dan will talk to. Uh, it increases parking and access to parking, I believe some 156 additional parking spaces. It decreases operational costs by eliminating those traffic signals and bringing in LED lighting into the downtown area. And that all combines to increase the property values. Uh, where we stand with permits right now, we've submitted to South Florida Water Management District for the ERP permit. Uh, within a few days, we'll be submitting to the United States Coast Guard for the bridge modification permits. And we've done our due diligence with uh, U the U.S. Car Army Corps of Engineers, as well as others, uh, where permits are not going to be required. We've developed bid scopes and put the 60% plans at this point out to subcontractors for verification pricing and, and to help start creating that guaranteed maximum price. Uh, we've gotten very deeply into the utility coordination uh, and design is underway by FPNL, uh, Comcast, I believe CenturyLink, as well as a lot of coordination with Bonita Springs Utility to enhance some of the uh, underground utilities in the downtown corridor. I uh, wanted to just bring this slide to, to everybody's attention and talk about what the original scope of where it work was and where we're at today. Uh, the original RFQ, generally uh, speaking, was to uh, improve from Oak Creek to just north of the Imperial River along Old US 41 and Phelps Avenue. Uh, the city has expanded that scope at this point to add from the Imperial River up to Terry Street, as well as those connections, the side streets to the, that connect Feltz and Old 41 to the east as well as to the west. <clears throat> as Matt said, we've held two public information workshops. Uh, the first one resulted in 20, some 20 one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. We've reviewed public and business input. Uh, we've incorporated those changes, as many as we possibly could, and we've addressed questions as they've arisen. Uh, the second workshop, uh, March 31st, we did have 105 attendees. I Matt spoke to that, 86 before. And, and, and I want to thank the public because we've been involved in projects like this before, and we've never had that kind of input from the public. And it's, it's been great. Uh, it, that second meeting resulted in 17 more, I think it's more, it's north of that at this point, with business, property owners, uh, many of those numerous meetings with those, uh, uh, those representatives. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Mangan and let him start talking about the elements of the design. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Kevin Mangan with Stantec. Uh, I'm a landscape architect and, and certainly part of uh, this right construction team. Uh, really, the streetscape work is, is uh, key to uh, what I've been involved with. But uh, as, as Andy has said, uh, uh, a lot of great uh, public participation. In fact, the process has, has brought forth a number of people in, in both uh, you know, the, uh, the two uh, workshop meetings but even subsequent meetings, the, the individual meetings thereafter uh, have really facilitated a lot of individual back and forth, not just between the team, but actually amongst property owners who live and work and own property side by side. So uh, really commend the city and, and the public here on that process. Uh, just to go through a few of the uh, comments, you've seen these comments, they're in your package, uh, but there are many, uh, but we tried to highlight a few of them here. Uh, landscaping, it, one of the key elements in the, in the uh, project, a lot of interest in the community of the type of plant material, some comments being very specific to that, uh, the types, na use of native plants, low water, low maintenance, these sorts of things uh, are certainly important to us as well as the community. At our last meeting, we had a number of materials, actual brick pavers and, and samples of, of colors and many other things that uh, we suggest be 
used here in, uh, in the project. These comments really a reflection of this. Um, use of uh, you know, certain colors in certain areas, uh, no fading, uh, and uh, generally how and where we would use those colors. But uh, as, uh, as that goes, uh, some nice feedback that actually also rolls into the street furnishings. And you know, I always look at the landscape, the hardscape, and the street furnishings as really a, you think of that as a complete package. They all really need to work together. So the street furnishings, uh, we also have examples, really talk about furnishings oftentimes in families so that there's a real relationship between the, the bench and the trash can and the bike rack and the colors, the light poles uh, as materials go. Here you see some alternatives, and in fact, uh, well, the first slide I think really gained the preference of the community uh, on the 31st of March. Uh, there was also interest in the alternatives, alternatives in color, alternatives in texture, and how we might use those. Lighting was also very important uh, to the community, not just the uh, potential reuse of the street lights or, or a similar light pole that we have today with the banners and banner arms, uh, the LED lighting, uh, again, uh, one thing that is uh, something that we always look to do, the dark, star, uh, dark sky compliance, uh, but a number of great <coughs> comments, uh, even all the way down to the ground level in the pedestrian lighting and how we do that uh, uh, certainly of, of significance to the community. Parking comments, as you've heard, uh, concern about the adequacy of parking, the amount of parking, how much do we bring uh, to the community? Is that enough uh, into the future? Uh, there's probably more parking questions to ask, uh, but uh, certainly a, a key component of uh, what, uh, what the community has been looking at. Medians. Uh, medians also, uh, where they are, where they exist, where the cuts in those medians are in terms of turning movements. Uh, we actually uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time, uh, not in our public workshop, but uh, also with the fire department. They have interest in that too, and we've been able to answer their questions and their concerns as we go along. Uh, whether it's no medians in certain areas uh, or the use of medians, uh, which really is a benefit to uh, the pedestrians, which we'll talk of in a, in a few minutes. Roundabouts, you've, you've heard before. Uh, the roundabout uh, commentary uh, continues uh, from both a positive standpoint of experiences where uh, they uh, lessen the traffic jams uh, and really create improvements within the community, both traffic flow and the services around, uh, but also those that don't like the roundabout uh, and, and prefer the traffic lights. You heard that tonight uh, prior to this presentation. Bridge comments. Uh, this is one that's near and dear to my heart since I'm a graphics guy in the public meeting. Uh, rather than a written comment, we got a sketch. I like that. Um, but uh, the idea in this sketch was, as you can see in our illustrative that we were showing was sort of a horizontal railing and the talk here was perhaps a vertical great idea actually stormwater improvements uh, really I think the public has come to understand that very well um, in in that uh, we're doing uh, double duty here where we create parking parallel parking angled parking, and perpendicular parking because we have all of that uh, represented in the project this is the area where we're able to do our stormwater um, improvements. And uh, you'll hear in just a minute uh, at to what level we're able to do that. And that goes directly to the economic benefit uh, of the future development um, underground in terms of stormwater, but also an association of parking as it relates to uh, private property and businesses uh, alongside it. So the general comments uh, have, have been uh, uh, really uh, good comments, I think, for, first of all, uh, but uh, really sort of pointing us back to uh, really a simple statement and one that we've started with is uh, this, this is about the city of Bonita Springs, being consistent in the Florida style and representative of this community. Um, think about the festivals, think about the things that we have and make sure that that's uh, engaged in part of these plans. We've made a number of revisions, as you heard, uh, since uh, the evening of the 31st, and, and these are, are represented here in the plan above, as Andy spoke to. Um, accesses uh, to individual properties, as we sat down with individual property owners and understood 
functionality of sites, we were able to work with those. Um, we, uh, again, have had the opportunity to work with multiple owners in meetings and actually begin to facilitate some of the work that they might do behind the right-of-way lines outside of the project area that could benefit not just themselves but help us tie down uh, certain improvements uh, to those properties uh, collectively. Uh, we've uh, had meetings and shared uh, design work, concept work, truthfully, uh, with the Wonder Gardens. And so we've made some adjustments in terms of how they prefer, what their preferred access points are. Um, and, and again, the coordination uh, ongoing with different uh, uh, tenants and owners in terms of the uh, individual sites. Um, plan revisions, uh, again, that were made uh, in meetings with the fire chief and, again, the public comments. We had uh, Dean Crockett and Goodwin Streets uh, closed down uh, with the medians. We've opened them back up um, for flow, left turn lanes, and, and, and fire access, uh, as, as they uh, had asked for. The access in the alleyway to Wilson Street, uh, at, between Wilson and, and Reynolds, uh, that, was, that was always part of the plan to improve it. Um, we've, I think, just made it simpler to understand and know that that is an improved uh, alleyway. Uh, pavers on the Oak Creek Bridge, again, to symbolize gateway and, and to bring forth entry into this downtown area. Um, right away access and the confirmation and adjustments that we've needed to do on an individual property basis. And the team also, uh, once we had uh, the uh, comments in hand from the 31st, which we gave the public about a week to follow up with, uh, we took those plans, those comments, we've walked the streets, we've again, you know, field checked what we've done in terms of design against uh, actual conditions. And so we continue to, to do that, and we've truthfully done that right up to the end of last week with the individual meetings we've had. So in summary, uh, we feel in the review of the comments that uh, we've general endorsement of, of the content of this project. Uh, the uh, design of this project at, at both the 30 first, the evening of the 31st, but even today, is really a reflection of, of the good engineering and the practices we know from the development of downtown areas, streetscapes, roundabouts, uh, as well as inclusive of public uh, comment and input. And again, as you know, with council approval today, we'll move to the 90 percent. So um, I'm going to continue on here, but I'm going to ask uh, Michael Walwork also to join me at the mic as, as we move through the next series of slides. Uh, but one of the things, and we are, uh, we are just uh, going to review the components of this plan, because the, the plan is made up of not individual components, but it's, it's really the collection of those things that where the strength of this plan is. And um, that, that's critically important as we look at each one. Each one has another element or another purpose in the totality of bringing together this comprehensive uh, streetscape. This uh, was an exhibit from the night of the 31st, and one simply to try and on a, on a block basis, but it's one we do throughout all the blocks of the project, break down and help understand why we have done things the way we have across the, the cross section of uh, US 41. And this edge, this line on both sides, is your right-of-way line. So that's, your, that's basically private property at that point. And so in the simplest of terms, on both sides of the street, we have a pedestrian zone. Inside of that pedestrian zone, we have what we call furniture, landscape, and parking. That zone is doing multiple things for us as you move through it, providing all of those uh, uh, components. And a reminder that where we have parking, we also have our stormwater drainage below. So now we're not just doing in a two-dimensional horizontal way across the right-of-way. We're really dealing with a, a third dimension here of benefit um, to, uh, to the downtown area. We have our travel ways, north and south, and then generally the median. Now this is, this is the Pennsylvania roundabout. Uh, this happens to be the firehouse. Well, we're able to extend the median to this point out of the roundabout uh, headed south. This portion from here to here, because it's in front of the firehouse, we can articulate it in a different pavement material, but it's at the ground level so that fire trucks can roll in and out of the uh, fire station. 
we use that in other intersections and in other intersection or other areas uh, the median is raised like you see here. Part of the purpose of the raised median is halfway across that right of way then becomes a pedestrian refuge in the crossing. Currently we have about 50 feet of asphalt between all of the travel lanes and turn lanes in that intersection. So today's plans by the use of the combination of these elements uh, also, one of the things we see, in particular the islands, is that uh, we simplify the pedestrian movement across the street, we shorten the 50-foot crossing down to an 11-foot crossing, basically the width of the travel lane, and they're only having to deal with one direction of traffic at a time. You're either looking up the street or you're looking down the street, and you cross uh, as such. Michael, you may want to talk about the roundabout real quick. Okay. Um, I, in the RFQ, the, the city had mentioned their desire for a consideration of a roundabout of Pennsylvania, and we thought it was a great idea because with my work I've done around the country is a lot of places are now looking within their retail areas to have a focal point, something that where people can gather around, and the best way of creating that focal point is you know, with a roundabout that not only you can landscape, but you can use special lighting to further enhance that focal area at night time with different coloured lighting and different style of lighting. And so um, we've put a lot of effort into uh, getting that roundabout to work, making sure all the properties around there had good access in and out of their properties and the existing driveways. Um, I you know, modified the median uh, up north here, so there's a driveway to the ice cream shop. We've shortened that um, Splinter Island to just a small bit, you know, to provide some protection to the pedestrians there. And, and so uh, with all this um, special landscaping, this will become a real feature point within the whole project. And the Pennsylvania Roundabout was something that was in, in the RFP for us to take a look at. And we strongly believe that this is the right solution here, uh, as well as Terry Street. And as I know you know the history of, of the Terry Street intersection, but it, uh, through crash records and everything else, we know it's one of the worst, if not the worst, in this county uh, and has the same uh, dubious honor at a state level as well. And so the Roundabout uh, at, at both these locations uh, really goes for to traffic flow, but pedestrian and, and automobile safety. One of the last things I'll just point to, as I was talking, the pedestrian zone, furnishing zone, travel way, this Winter Park, Naples, Florida, and this is actually just a little seating area out in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. But you can see the redevelopment and the building facade. You got pedestrian zone, then you've got landscape, furnishing, and then beyond that is the parking and traffic. Here in Naples, again, the back of this sidewalk is the right-of-way. Uh, this happens to be taken in an area where we're not, I'm not adjacent to uh, a redevelopment site. Uh, redevelopment has then come to the back of the right-of-way. But you have, again, pedestrian zone, landscape, furnishing. Here, they have enough room in this uh, Fifth Avenue cross-section to park on the curb without uh, the landscape the travel way, and then it repeats itself across the street. So why parallel parking? Um, first of all, it promotes and, 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 and really provides a benefit to the properties and the parcels uh, adjacent to it. It allows for a uh, dimensionally efficient use of the right-of-way for us. And then it becomes a common zone uh, for furnishing landscape and drainage as well. We do that right. We share that up and down the street. We do a number of things uh, that a complete street uh, wants to have. We are, uh, as we said, a fixed 70 foot right away for most of its length. We're actually down to 60 feet in front of the Wonder Gardens. And then actually at both ends, the far ends of the project, we open back up again. But we're dealing with, for 90% of this project, 70 feet of right away. And so this cross section, uh, we feel, uh, is, is very fitting for what we're trying to do here. Promoting, first of all and, and foremost, really taking back uh, what is really much more of an automobile space today and promoting the pedestrian, the multi-modal uh, uses uh, that really, uh, they try to engage it, but it's very hard to in the, in the condition we're in today. And uh, essential for the promotion of business. And Michael, I've, you've got an interesting stat. 
Yeah, well, well, I've done a lot of work with the Florida Main Street Association and other main streets around the country. And one of the things I've learned over the years that it depends on the environment and where you are within your development of your main street. But typically the figures um, are a parking space in front of a business is worth five to $25,000 a year per parking space. And that is why around the country now, as main streets are redeveloped, um, that the on-street parking is the most vital part of that redevelopment because that's where the businesses get most of their value. And that figure has been around for many, many years now. And um, you know, depends on the biggest, bigger the cities, the more value there is with the on-street parking. And the reason for that is that with on street parking in front of a business, someone driving down the road will sit, you know, see you know, a sh particular store they want to go into, they'll find the on street parking, they park, run into the store, get what they get, want, come out, drive off, and that leaves the space for somebody else. Right? And that turnover throughout a year adds a lot of value to the business that has that in front. What are the other elements? Landscape medians. Why, why the medians? Uh, it slows traffic. Uh, first of all, it's, it's known that uh, from the width we have, if we were to narrow that down, uh, you know, creates a perception and a friction along the edges of an automobile and, and for the driver as you move through a space uh, <coughs> that slows the traffic. And then it provides, as noted earlier, the safe harbor uh, for the pedestrian crossing. Here actually is a mid-block crossing, Los Olos Boulevard at Fort Lauderdale, and you see the median here. Uh, park cars here, travel way here. Uh, this is a situation that they can manage between uh, travel and, and parking. And actually it was the store owners that brought this city management uh, many years ago uh, that uh, they were desperate for this on-street parking in front of their businesses. And so they've been able to uh, figure that out for themselves. But a great example of the median, the shade of the trees, the creation of this environment. If you know Los Olos Boulevards, the uh, old Riverside Hotel, but great example here of that pedestrian safe harborage. Um, as I said, provides the landscape, hardscape, and shade opportunities, and it is one of the safety countermeasures that the uh, Federal Highway Administration recommends in, uh, in roadways and streetscapes. Uh, I'll add to that in that the reason it's a safety measure, right, as far as the federal government is concerned, is that it breaks the pedestrian crossing up into two parts. So the pedestrian crosses one lane of traffic onto a refuge and then looks the other way and deals with one lane of traffic. So that makes it safe for pedestrians uh, to get across the road. But a second feature of it is that if you put in a series of pedestrian crossings down the road, a pedestrian who wants to go across the road to a shop from where they are, they have to now walk down the street cross the crossing and walk all the way back again. With a raised median there, albeit at you know, the minimum standard, a pedestrian can cross that street anywhere they wish to do along that street. And that gives the pedestrian a much higher level of mobility to move between stores than they would if you don't have the median and they have to walk up and down the street to find a pedestrian crossing. I'll let Michael speak to the roundabouts, but as, as, a, as we know, we've got two. We're talking Pennsylvania and, and Terry Street. Okay. Um, w with a roundabout, the uh, most important part of a roundabout is that it eliminates about 75% of the conflicts between the users of the intersection, bicycles, pedestrians, and vehicles. And by Eliminating those conflicts, it naturally makes the intersection much safer. Um, also, any user going around a roundabout only has to look in one direction at a time for the conflict. doesn't matter what type of user you are. Okay? But you think of a signalised intersection. If you want to cross the road at a signalised intersection, you go look for traffic both ways who may be running the red light. You've got the right turn on red, and then you have left turners. So just a simple crossing at signals, you've got four ways to look um, just for that crossing to start. At a roundabout, you look one way, okay, and then the other way on the other side. 
Also, what a roundabout does for the pedestrian is that at a signal, a pedestrian has to wait for permission to cross the road. And if you go down to Terry Street, it can take you 60 seconds or more to wait for permission to cross the road. Okay? With the roundabout, they have almost instantaneous crossing. <coughs> they do have to take due care and make sure that vehicle stops, so it's not quite instantaneous, but it's, it's fairly quick, much faster than signals. And it's the same for bicycles as well. If the roundabout is designed correctly, you have, typically have an operating speed at 15 to 20 mile an hour. You can always have the pretend racing car drivers that will, in, when there's no one around, will go faster, but um, typically it's 15 to 20 mile an hour, and that makes it a lot harder for people to have a crash when you're travelling at a low speed. Okay. Um, the Florida DOT strongly supports roundabouts, and I'll just mention um, Secretary Hathaway, when he was appointed Secretary in District 1, your district, he has worked with the, you know, in, within the Florida DOT to get the DOT to come up with three objectives. Pedestrian safety and mobility, bicycle safety and mobility, and the uh, widespread construction of roundabouts. In fact, the policy in the DOT now, every district in the DOT uh, was given in 2011 five years to get at least two roundabouts on the road in every district. And they're all work, I can tell you now, they're all working towards that goal. District 1, um, uh, Secretary Hathaway just approved another roundabout for US 41. So between Sarasota Airport and US 41, and Orange Avenue to the south of downtown Sarasota, the Florida DOT has now approved, I think it's 11 or 12, two lane and possibly a couple of three lane roundabouts. The first two of which will be, uh, will, the construction will start next year. And you know, I'm working on the final construction plans right now. Secondly, um, the Florida, uh, District 1 is doing their first complete street. Oh, it's the first for the Florida DOT, by the way. And on that, it, that street, it's 15th Street, Manatee County. It's been rebuilt, rather than a four-lane road, it's getting rebuilt as a two-lane road with a median, uh, bike lanes, because they've got 100 foot of right of way, uh, uh, on-street parking, median, uh, planter strip and so forth. They're getting built for a very similar reason that you're rebuilding old US 41 create a pedestrian friendly environment with an upgraded road to enhance the development process, uh, pro, um, enhance the development along uh, 15th Street. And 15th Street, at the last count, I just finished off my analysis layout for the 12th roundabout. And um, they're one lane, two lane, and a couple of three lane roundabouts, all approved by the DOT um, for and Manatee County. So uh, with that, uh, um, there, the Florida DOT is going to be building lots of roundabouts, not just one lane roundabouts, but two and three lane roundabouts, because they're safer for pedestrians, safer for bicycles, and safer for vehicles. Okay. And um, also what a roundabout does has one benefit that signals don't have, you can landscape it. And one of the things I've found out over the years uh, this is Sarasota, the five points. You can see the landscaping they put into that. This is Cape uh, Coral Gables, where a developer couldn't get his permit because the signals were saturated and he couldn't expand. So I designed him a roundabout and he got his permit, and that's for the villages of Merrick Park. That roundabout was what enabled that development to go ahead. Okay. But you can see here, there's many ways of landscaping a roundabout to enhance that centre feature of them. And some cities actually have public art competitions to select a piece of public art to go inside uh, the roundabouts. Uh, the only thing is, they have to be big, like 15 feet, 20 feet, and you know, quite wide in proportion to the roundabout. So drivers had good visibility of it, but you can't have them going round and round and zing zang and all this thing going on. They, got, they have to be static. And 
another thing for uh, using roundabouts is they are one of the nine safety countermeasures from the Federal Highway Administration. Traffic signals are not rated as a safety device from the Federal Highway Administration because there's too many accidents to all users at signalised intersections. Um, here's, here's a roundabout. These, all these roundabouts were put in for, to enhance the pedestrian environment. This one in Manchester, I designed that one because there was a retail development that was going in and they wanted to enhance accessibility into that development for, by pedestrians and vehicles. And so that was a roundabout that I came up with. And it's interesting, we had a river going right under that roundabout. Okay. But it worked. Um, Sarasota, they pulled out this traffic signal there, put in a roundabout to enable the pedestrians to cross the road quickly. With the signals there, um, a large proportion of the pedestrians would cross against the red light because it took them so long to get across with the, with the pedestrian walk signal. And you can see it's really enhanced the business on that corner. Carmel, Indiana, that was in a development uh, pedestrian area. The mayor of Carmel, Indiana, uh, Brian Stone, he, his goal is to place every signal in Carmel with a roundabout. He, so far, they've got about 70 built. Okay, so uh, that, that's their goal. This one in Brainton Beach on the state highway on the island there, um, the Florida DOT was concerned because they were getting one or two pedestrians killed every year or so at that crossing of pedestrians trying to go from their residence across the road to the beach. So I designed the roundabout for them and in the five years following that roundabout going in, there was no pedestrian crashes. Even though I think there was about five in the five years beforehand. So it has been proven a real safety feature for pedestrians. Okay. Undergrounding of uh, the power and the work and the utilities in, in the street uh, actually is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, goes to uh, street character, the aesthetic, and the, and the creation of the uh, environment we're looking for. Uh, much more pleasing, um, allows business signage and, and visibility to come forward, the architectural details, uh, those that exist today, but certainly those of redevelopment, and uh, just establishes a better, more pleasant streetscape. Uh, stormwater solutions. I'm going to bring uh, Dan Brundage up to talk to those directly. He's, uh, he's involved with those and responsible to those. But as a reminder, uh, at that five to $25,000 of uh, receipts to a parallel parking or a parking space outside, uh, the advantage that Dan's going to talk about in economic development really is a twofold combination of things in these spaces. Thank you, Kevin. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah, uh, I'm with Agnoli, Barber, and Brunage. We've been tasked with uh, design of the highway and drainage system. And when we started this project, the city staff uh, tasked us with two goals. Uh, one was to uh, improve the flooding situation that's in the area that's been uh, historically uh, a real hard spot for people to put up with during uh, g g any given wet season or major storm event. And the second one was to get as much water quality uh, that we could as possible so that we could start establishing a water quality bank, if you will, where uh, future development could come in and withdraw credits from that bank to help them in their development uh, of the area. That's right. Uh, so I'll talk about the, uh, the stormwater management approach first. This is the one that deals with uh, mainly with uh, the, the improved drainage aspects of the projects, and then we'll move into water quality. This is a schematic of the drainage system, and we have Old 41 Road up here. Feltz Avenue is along this way, and this is a portion of Old 41 that is north of the Imperial River. We currently have four uh, existing outfall pipes that discharge into the river, and we're going to take advantage of those existing pipes and actually use that. We're not going to be expanding the sizes of those at all. Uh, the main backbone of the system in this area is going to be continuing that 48-inch outfall that's in this area up <clears throat> in this direction. It eventually necks down to a 24 in this area, and then we're also going to tie it into the existing outfall here at Oak Creek. 
The other major outfall is going to be the system <coughs> along Feltz Avenue. We'll start with a 30-inch pipe here, which is actually going to be a slight reduction from what's out there already. And it'll progress upstream to where it'll become a 24-inch in this area here. Now, one of the unique things of this design, you don't see in a lot of storm water management systems, we're going to connect these two outfalls together with the side streets that exist between 041 and Feltz Avenue. This will give us a lot of interconnectivities to let water move where it needs to go and increase the capacity, actually, of the system. Now, all of these pipes will be designed uh, in conjunction with parking, as Kevin's already mentioned, and I'll show you that on a, uh, a slide that's coming up. That will be our exfiltration system, which is the main engine of the water quality improvements that we'll be getting out of the project. This is uh, just a little drawing to show you two uh, basin boundaries. The purple boundary is the actual boundary of the area where a drop of rainfall that falls within this purple area is going to drain to our new system. And our new system will be designed to handle that. The outside area mirrors the boundaries of the downtown redevelopment area. And this is the area we want to be able to be able to apply the water management credits to. So we're actually going to be doing excess water quality treatment in the purple area so that we can extend those credits to the larger outside area. Uh, a couple of things about our permitting and the water quality uh, improvement itself is uh, we have currently filed for a ERP permit application with South Florida Water Management District. One element of that will be a conceptual approval of the water quality credit scheme that we're working up. And uh, the advantage of this permit will be is when we do get it, it'll memorialize the fact that the city can uh, implement this process of having a water quality mitigation bank. And that, as I mentioned before, the parking area in conjunction with an exfiltration trench located underneath it is the engine for the water quality system. We are very blessed in this particular area of the city with uh, soils that have a high percolation rate. And that means that that soil uh, outside of the exfiltration area has a capacity to move a lot of that water out of that uh, exfiltration trench and put it back in the ground. Uh, also, you'll see that, oops, got to go back. Uh, there we go. You'll see that we have a, uh, a pipe that's located under each one of these. And these, will, these pipes will actually serve two functions. One will be to conduct water to an outfall but they'll also help remove uh, any excess water that's left over and, and get the system drained down so it's ready to receive the next storm event that happens. Now to prevent over drainage of the area, we're gonna locate weir strategically along the whole system that'll force the water, the initial first flush, if you will, of a storm to be stored and it will not be able to pass out of this system until the water level it reaches the crown of the pipe right here. So it, it, once water level in this pipe fills up to this point, it'll be able to flow over and exit the system. And we're estimating that about 80% of the storms that you have in this area is going to be of a certain level that it'll all percolate. We really want to have that much runoff from those in this area. It'll be those uh, storms that are in excess of that that will cause the, the overflow uh, toward the outfall. Now, the secret to the system is that the, the more water we can pull out of the storm drainage system and put it back into the ground, is that much less water that's going to flow into the Imperial River. So we're forcing all those nutrients and the dirty part back into the soil where it can be absorbed by the bacterial uh, processes in the soil. And the water that actually uh, then exits to the river is cleaned up and it's going to be a smaller quantity than if it was allowed to directly discharge. This is one of these spreadsheets that engineers love to put together. Uh, it's kind of it's even confusing to me some days. But uh, the bottom line is this is a summary of all of the uh, amount of nutrients we can remove with the system, and it's a calculation of the water that percolates into the ground. I'm just going to cut to the bottom line, and it's really summed up in this last sentence here that a one acre of intense multi-use development would only utilize roughly about 1% of the credits that we're going to be able to get out of the system. So that is a huge lift that we're getting uh, for this system. Now, if you have a project come in that's not in as intense as a downtown project would be, it would withdraw a lesser percentage of the credits. So these credits are going to go a long way towards uh, assisting in redevelopment of the system. 
And uh, we've highlighted in here an area uh, that would be along Abernathy Street and between Feltz. It's approximately one half of the, the block. Oops, I did it again. And uh, that would be a, a roughly one acre area to give you an idea of uh, the type of project that would remove 1% uh, of those credits. With that, Kevin? Thanks, Dan. So uh, we, we've seen a number of successful streetscape projects. We have them around us uh, in Naples, uh, Titusville. A project does involve with, again, you ped pedestrian zones, furnishing uh, landscape uh, zones, parking, uh, travelways, side street parking, parking in, in you know, one block so off. Uh, there's great examples, uh, many that have uh, been associated with uh, through my 30 years. Uh, and uh, certainly successful roundabout projects. Uh, Michael, what was the number that you've been involved with? Uh, I, I've, I've forgotten, oh. lost count of how many I've done now, but uh, one, of the, one of the most successful ones is La Jolla Boulevard where you had that five lane road where literally pedestrians couldn't cross the road. Parents had to drive their kids across the road. That's w what it was like. Uh, afterwards, when we um, put in the raised median, um, put in five roundabouts, um, put in the on-street parking on both sides and did all the landscaping, uh, to which incidentally the community banded together and they actually did the landscape design. So all this, the plant selection and where the plants were, were all done by the community and with only with the assistance of the landscape architects. So the community really, once they saw what they were going to get, they really came together and actually participated in the design. And um, you, got, you got all the roundabouts there and that has been very, even though it was opened in 2008 right in the economic recession, um, it certainly has improved. The traffic volume didn't go down as much here as it did on parallel streets because people like uh, pretty streets. But the pedestrian and bicycle volume on that street now has gone up enormously. And uh, I spoke to a police officer there a couple of years ago and he does six months on, six months off. Since the roundabout, uh, w since the whole streetscape went in, he hasn't been to one single crash. Right, which I think was pretty good after three years and he's been on the job for eight, um, 18 of those months. So that was a good indictment of the whole design with the whole low operating speed. And this one is at Asheville. It's again, it's a five-lane road uh, going to a two-lane road with the roundabout. You notice the difference here? Big parking lot, buildings. So by changing the streetscape, um, getting rid of vehicle lanes, putting in a roundabout, improving the uh, operation, uh, including a median all, day, you know, all the way up and down the road. Um, we did have some pedestrian crossings along the road as well as the median, but then the pedestrians cross where they want. They don't necessarily cross at the crossings. But it has facilitated a lot of redevelopment, not small scale, big scale redevelopment along there. So. What we have been talking about, you know, Kevin and I, we've been doing this sort of stuff for many years, and we can show you that this stuff really works. So, uh, last slide, next steps. Uh, we are prepared to uh, bring this project to uh, its 90% completion. Along with that, as you heard earlier, be a presentation from Wright Construction, the cost to build this job on a guaranteed uh, basis. Uh, and literally, we're ready to begin construction. Uh, as you heard earlier, uh, permits are underway and, and efforts to that end so that we can begin this summer. Um, and uh, so with that, uh, thank you for your time and uh, open it for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Want to get the lights for a second so we can sure. everybody can see what's going on here? All right, Council. Uh, I, I have to tell you, this is mm -hmm. one of the most exciting moments that I've experienced at City Council since 2000. Uh, unbelievable. So, but I won't, I'll shut up for a minute here. A minute. Uh, Council, do you have any questions for them? Uh, any questions for staff or for the consultant? Yeah. Anything? Yes, Mike. Um, well, just more some concerns. Um, I, I basically ran for city council to give the businesses down there more of a voice. Um, and, and a lot of them feel that, you know, we're kind of limiting access to their businesses. Uh, you know, they're losing uh, 
access from old 41. Um, I, I just feel that we're kind of um, changing the whole look and, or flavor of old 41, kind of looking towards the future, but we're not thinking about what's there right now. Um, so I, I'd like to just see some more considerations to, to help, uh, like especially uh, with new life tires, uh, you know, th they could really use that um, old 41 access. You know, when they do have a larger vehicle, instead of having to back around and try to get out one of the two side entrances to be able to get out the front. Um, and, and so mainly, if, if the approval goes through today, how, what can still be changed after the fact, you know, are, are we still going to be working with businesses down there? I mean, is this pretty much it after the 60 percent approval or? Uh, so great question. Uh, and as you heard from Mr. Saunders earlier, too, uh, there, there's more work to do uh, with Shangri-La. So there are certainly some individual elements down there uh, to continue to refine. And, and to that end, it's always uh, a, a better thing when there's ideas that are um, uh, known and understood from a private property standpoint and what they're trying to accomplish and how we might be able to meet that. So uh, yes to that end, uh, we do not have any more um, public workshops uh, as part of uh, the work to do, uh, but we do recognize uh, through council and, and staff that there's, uh, uh, there's some elements uh, left there uh, at individual properties. Uh, but for the most part, um, you know, what we're looking for is the, the approval of the 60% plan, the elements in these plans, and the combination of the elements. Again, I remind you that those are critically important in the combination of the things and how they really do work together. Um, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the next 30 days for us is to uh, cinch all that together, anything that's left on, on that public, uh, uh, private connection that you're speaking of to get that done part of the 60 percent plans and we also recognize truthfully with uh, 18 month uh, to you know perhaps two years of construction that private side development is going to come along in that period of time and so the the truth of the matter is that there is a there's a level of flexibility that we've uh, had in this part of the process and that's got to be part of the process until uh, until we're done with this job um, you know it's interesting uh, with the uh, groundbreaking that's coming up on Saturday um, as best we know uh, and actually sure unity as well has shared a plan with us as best we know in what their future plans are uh, for development We've already got those those curb cuts and those things tied down. So, uh, you know, we're as good as the information we have in that regard. But this has got to be part of the process going forward because we are we do recognize some things will change that we don't know about in the well, future. Well, I mean, but that but that's true. I've thought about it because it the same thing Mike's been thinking about. And we're not we're not building something here that's going to never change ever ever ever. More than likely, I mean, you're going to learn things during construction that oh my gosh that's that's not going to work i mean you, in the field you're going to learn things and and uh, even after you finish people we're going to find out as a city ah you know what that curb isn't that's that uh, that opening is dangerous we're going to have to close it off or you know what we're really going to need to have an opening in another place it and and those those uh those curb cuts they're not it's not, it's not like it's an impossible thing to do it's really easy it happens all the time we make curb cuts and other entrances all the time. I, I suspect that this whole thing, this is a un unbelievably great start. And as we go along, we're going to learn. For the next 20 or 30 years, we're going to be making small adjustments to this thing. Yeah, That's hope, what I would suspect. I, I, I and it's not, it's not impossible. It's going to happen, right? I, I agree with that. In fact, if it's going to spread inward as much as it's going to spread outward to the neighborhoods and the other things that surround it. Different projects, different times, different budgets. But that's exactly right. Well, and the, the other thing, you know, the biggest negative feedback I've been getting is on the roundabouts. Um, you, you know, have we looked at enhanced signalization at the uh, the intersections or, you know, something that can be done to make it look better, make it work better, but without the roundabouts? Yeah, Michael. Yeah. Well, we're in a, a Terry Street, you know, and this is uh, one of the reasons for doing a roundabout at Terry Streets. Yeah, uh, I used to be a traffic signal designer, okay? I designed and built signals and coordinated signals. And looking at the Terry Street, and you and I met there this afternoon when, when I was videotaping the, the intersection, 
those signals are pretty darn good signals now, okay? Um, I think the cycle times are a little bit longer than I personally would use, but it's operating, you know, as well as a signalised intersection will work, okay? And it's got all the turn lanes that you could fit within the right of way and so forth, okay? But despite that, despite how good the signals are and, and the, uh, the signal heads and their placement and all that sort of thing, um, that is, as mentioned earlier, one, the, probably the most dangerous intersection in the whole area for pedestrians and bicyclists. And yet it has got everything that we as traffic signal designers can put into a signalised intersection. And therefore, um, since this is supposed to be a highly pedestrian or orientated project, we can't leave a intersection, you know, that's the most dangerous in the area for pedestrians untreated. And so, you know, we you know, looked, I, I looked at the signals, what we could do with the signals and some minor tweaks, the timing's about all. That doesn't remove the conflicts that exist there now for all the users of it. So the only alternative for, um, in line with the Friday DOT policy, Federal Highway Administration, Insurance Institute of Highway Safety, the only option we have to dramatically improve the safety of that intersection is to put a roundabout in, okay? I know, and since I've done every form of intersection control, there is no other than a roundabout if we want to make that safer for everybody. Is, is this a case of perception in real, versus reality? I mean, really, when you, when you talk about it, because some of us have an aversion of, oh, I'll never get on an airplane, I'll never do this. I mean, yeah. uh, but, but there's a reality beyond what our own personal experience is. I mean, isn't, isn't it? I mean, this conversation isn't unusual, is it? No, this conversation occurs everywhere I go. <laughs> I've been having this conversation for, uh, gosh, uh, since 92, oh. right? So that's what, 20, 25, uh, three years now, I've been having exactly the same conversation all around the, the country. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with one, a number of people grew up in the New England area of the US and dealt with traffic circles and those things are downright dangerous and they're either being signalised or converted to roundabouts right now and I've done some of those conversions for New Jersey. Um, the, um, sorry, I, I lost my thought there. Um, but uh, another um, reason for this sort of, you know, uh, opposition to roundabouts to a large extent is people haven't really experienced good um, design roundabouts, so I encourage anyone, you don't have to believe a single word I have said, okay? Just go to Sarasota, go to Clearwater. Um, Clearwater's got 34 roundabouts there. One lanes, they've got them near schools. Um, you have uh, the city of Sarasota, they're going to have two lane roundabouts on US 41 next year. The, the city has already built I think it's about five roundabouts and there's a couple more coming in the downtown area. Um, but one of the important projects that I highly recommend anyone to go and look at is Honoré Avenue, Sarasota County, between Bee Ridge and Fruitful Road. That was originally going to be, it was a road that did not connect all the way through. Originally going to be six lanes. Then with public opposition it got reduced to four. Then the public, um, Jim Harriet, the public, uh, County engineer asked me, well, you know, would it work at two lanes with roundabouts? And I said, yes. So they built a two lane road with roundabouts. But one of the most notable features there is the fruitful elementary school is near the top end. They, um, and we talked to the school and we designed a roundabout on the corner of the school. And that now, according to the school principal, is the best thing we ever did was because it allowed the elementary school children to cross on Array Avenue and get to school. Um, and it's been a fantastic uh, improvement for them. But, you know, originally, yeah, in Sarasota County, we had the same sort of discussions. But now, the Sarasota County did a videotape, about a half hour videotape about that project and how great it is. And it's got six roundabouts on it. Right, um, well, it, it was also suggested that like the uh, traffic light at uh, Old 41 in Pennsylvania 
having a signal there kind of helps break up the traffic so that way pedestrians would be able to cross further down the road or people would be able to turn off of side streets and get on to old 41. Yeah. Is it better having a, a nicer looking signal there? Well, I, I've driven up old US 41 many times now and even walked sections of it. And as you notice today, I was out there for, gosh, almost an hour. So I spent a lot of time looking at the traffic. And uh, when I look at it, I don't see gaps in there right now with the signals. If you were very close to um, Terry Street, right, and the light goes red, then the platoon passes and you have some gaps, but then you have the right turners coming from Terry Street West turning in there. And you get down close to the bridge, um, a little further down, there is very little gaps in that traffic flow until they get stopped at the light and then you go further down and those gaps disappear very quickly. Um, and so it's, to me, you know, that's, you have so much traffic on old US 41 right now, it's almost continuous flow. So if you have a roundabout there or you have a, a signal, a signals there, that flow along there is going to be about the same because the roundabout and the signals are going to handle about the same amount of traffic, therefore the number of gaps and the spacing will be roughly the same. Okay. And that is why, from my perspective, the median is the most important part of this project because with such a heavy flow on old US 41, the pedestrians aren't going to have a chance to cross if they have to cross an undivided road. And the median gives them a chance to stop. And with the roundabouts, you get uh, guaranteed low speed all day which does make it a little easier for the pedestrians to cross the road. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, Steve. Just a couple of comments. Uh, thank you very much. There, uh, for, for the public as much as anything, there's been so much going on behind the scenes that you probably don't see or hear about. But, uh, you, you know, we sit up here and we're talking about 20 years and so on. But I think city staff on, on behalf of the city council has done the job they're supposed to do. They went, as, as I understand it, to every business owner every building on old 41 and either the owner themselves or the people that occupied that space and asked about issues and talked about the concerns and tried to work through them and to the to the point of 30 percent versus 60 percent we're seeing cut throughs now that we didn't see before things that the owners have talked to us about uh, access has been the big the big issue all along we don't want to destroy any businesses that's that's not the purpose the main streets are composed of small businesses and we need to support those and we will the, the, the question of roundabouts, my, my biggest question with roundabouts was public safety in terms of pedestrians and bicyclists. I've gone to Bike Walk Lee, I've, I've been to the MPO people, I've been to the folks that understand how, how you make it walkable downtown, and they're telling me it's safer. It's a better way of protecting the people on cycles, and bicycles, and so on. The question of the, of the width of the street and no bicycle lane, the bicycles have the right to be in that lane. That's their prerogative. If they want to ride in that lane, that's their prerogative. So yeah, you're going to have to spend a little time making sure you you pass cyclists safely, or that you don't pass them and let them get to where they're going to go. But that's part of this whole process of a walkable, bikeable downtown. And I'll, I'll make a prediction that there was a, a gentleman came up earlier and talked about a bridge off Felt Streets across Imperial. I think we're going to have two bridges because I think we'll have a bridge in 10 years to 15 years over Oak Creek and Imperial, so that we have a circular flow through the downtown. So where there may not be perfect access today, or at least seen perfect access, I think what you'll see from Bonita Beach Road right on through to, to Terry Street is an opportunity to come in the back way of a lot of these businesses. And as these, as these pieces of property grow on multi-use properties with retail and, and residential at the same time, Feltz is going to be another access that we need to have ready. And we're going to see it happen. Yeah, I, I said it earlier, changes, changes hard period but if we're if we're trying to do what's right for the city and hoping to protect the businesses that are there now then I think we're doing the right thing and I hate it that I have 20 year old friend 20 friends for 20 years that, that don't support this I wish I could make them happy but for the business sector in general and for the city as a whole uh, I, I think this is the right thing to do and I think we've done the right way we've done it in the right way so that's where I am Thank any, you. any other comments or questions Peter uh, a comment and then actually a question. Um, I know at least one person in this room knows where I'm talking about. I see Ben Hershenson back there, and perhaps you might, sir, as well. But when you, you know, I guess for folks that maybe have a fear 
of a roundabout versus a traffic circle. You know, you look at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Ben, I mean, that that traffic circle, right? I mean, you've, you've got 95 coming up from Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. It meets, you have Route 1 coming up the seacoast to New Hampshire. You have Route 4 meeting there, which will shoot you up to the White Mountains. And then you have the Route 1 bypass. Are you familiar with that I, circle? I'm not, by any- I, I have been through a number of circles up that area. Yes. Right. I mean, it's like qualifying for Daytona going through there, right? Yeah. But that is truly a traffic circle. And I did yes. look it up, and I see that the um, it's a quarter mile around mm-hmm. that traffic mm-hmm. circle. With these roundabouts, what are we talking is the yeah. distance of the circle itself? Uh, the Terry Street, the center island diameter is about 90 feet. And three times that is about 270 feet all the way around the circumference of the center island. Uh, and um, some of the circles, but that's, you know, that's the size is a big difference between oh, them. Okay. My, my point exactly. But a bigger difference is the speed. You know, like the, there's a circle near the, on the way from Boston to the Logan Airport. Uh, I did like 50 mile an hour through there. And um, I could have gone faster, except for some other cars going fast that were conflicting with me. I can't do 50 mile an hour through my roundabouts, even though I know exactly how to drive them. When I design a roundabout for 23 mile an hour, I can do probably 28, if there's no one around, okay? So uh, the thing I've learned regarding traffic circles from the people living it you know, and using them they hate the speed because they, they're coming in fast, they have to merge, weave with traffic that's doing you know, 45 mile an hour, and you're going around a circle at the same time as you're weaving to get into it and then get in the right lane so you can get out of it, right? And, and doing that, mixing and weaving with traffic at 45, 45 mile an hour, that is difficult for most people, right? And, and, and as a result of that, the traffic circles have a lot of crashes at them. Well, and I, right, and I guess that's my point for yeah. people that are fearing these. A, a traffic circle and a roundabout are two completely different yeah. things. Yeah. And yeah. when you see a roundabout like Ben maybe down in Newburyport, which is a modified roundabout, but people stop. People get out of their car. They go to a restaurant. They mm. ride a bicycle. They, they get out and walk. They go to the park. I mean, they're not looking to move through there at 50 miles an hour. They're looking to stop and shop and do things. Yeah. And it, it, it just creates an amazing yeah. environment. Yeah. Um, you know, growing up in New England, I have seen the difference in what they do to communities. Yeah. Well, the work I do with communities around the country is basically to you know, use the roundabouts to pedestrianize, to make it more bicycle friendly, imp- actually improve the traffic flow as well that also create that focal point within the community to spur redevelopment around there. And also, very importantly, as a gateway, to like Terry Street roundabout, to tell people, hey, you have arrived here, right? This is somewhere different than everywhere else in the country because it looks different, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a starting point of our redevelopment down the other side of it. And, and so many, even developers now, I'm doing a lot of work for developers now, and I'm going to be doing a, a roundabout in the middle of Winter Park on a five-legged intersection for a developer because he wants something grand. He owns the two-thirds of the property around it. So he's going to give up property to do a nice roundabout there. So it is a focal point for his development. Right? And so, you know. Good. Just, just, yeah, just a couple of quick, not to put you on the spot here, but I think a lot of us are familiar with Las Olas in Fort Lauderdale. Mm-hmm. Are we talking uh, comparable widths? Like when I think of Las Olas mm-hmm. and then I think of old downtown 41, yeah. we're talking roughly the same space yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, so, it's uh, roughly the same. Right. Uh, except down Las Olas, they, uh, as, as Kevin mentioned earlier, it's a, they have part-time parking there. Right, because for part of the day they have four lanes and part of the day they have you know, parking, uh-huh. and which is very common in Melbourne, Australia. We do exactly the same thing, right, to share lanes okay, throughout the day. Right. And just but, one last thing about the biking. I talked with Carl about this, and I sat, we went through with Matt and went through the presentation, but maybe in just a minute or two or take as much time as you'd like as far as I'm concerned, explain if you're a bicyclist how you're going to get through downtown. I, you know, I, I right. shared lanes, 
Okay. And I'll, if you could, if you could just walk through that for a minute, I okay. think that would help a lot of people visualize that. Okay. Well, one of the things I noticed in my um, stay out at the intersection this afternoon is a lot of bicyclists out there, right? They're mainly adults, um, but um, there's quite a few of them. Every one of them use the sidewalk to get there because, and there's a very simple reason, there is so much traffic on the road, okay? Right. So they're using the sidewalk. Now, um, in, in the future, if we're successful, the sidewalks are going to get very busy with people, okay? And so uh, they've got a choice then of, you know, because we don't have the space for a bike lane down there, okay? So they have a choice of riding uh, with the traffic, which will be going slower, because the median's going to help them you know, go slower. The on-street parking's going to help, will slow up some of the traffic. It'll give them the professional bicyclists, right, will be able to ride down the lane in front of it at about the same speed as the vehicles will. The, uh, most of the people I saw today, they're not going to ride on the, on the lane. They're not, you know, the, the, the competent commuter bicyclists. Um, I'm hoping that with the um, redevelopment of Phelps Street, making that into a more attractive corridor, that the bicycle, and, and I've just made a suggestion to the team today after my site inspection, that we probably need some signs at both ends to direct pe the bicyclists, you know, that don't want to ride in the lane, down Phelps. Because now Phelps is going to be a lot more attractive, and as far as the bicyclists are concerned, if they use Phelps, there will be uh, far less um, vehicles to deal with, you know, al almost no vehicles, you know, there. There'll be, uh, they won't have to use the sidewalk because of the lack of vehicles on the road. They can just ride up there. And then also, if this development is successful, which I believe it will be, you're going to have a lot of people turning in and out of the side streets to get to the parking in and out of the side streets. And that's going to mean a lot more conflicts for any bicyclists going up and down the street. So from the practical point of view, and I do ride a bicycle with my wife quite often, from the bicycle point of view, it's going to be a lot safer, a lot quicker, and a lot more desirable to go Phelps than use um, US 41 because less traffic, less pedestrians, less conflicts, and just a beautiful street. Thank you. Great. Good. Thank, thank thanks, you. thanks, Peter. Janet. Um, I think that what I'd like to see is obviously that we continue to work with people as this goes through, and the example that I can give of that is that when we did the widening of East Terry Street and medians went in and the next year and the year after that, we came back and we put two cut-throughs in. Yep. So we learned mm -hmm. from that, we tried it and we said, okay, well, we need the cut-through here and we need a cut-through here and we addressed it. So, you know, my hope is that what we're doing is not set in stone and then we're going to see and it's going to evolve and we're going to do what's best um, all around. I guess my question then at this point is, is there and do you see, your team see, uh, in the future that bridge connectivity then between Feltz and Center? Because I think that that's very um, integral to giving bicyclists and even cars and pedestrians an alternative than to stay off of, you know, the other, the uh, busier street. Yeah, that incidentally is one of the comments I made back last November when we actually got started on this project, once I knew about the traffic, right, and knew what type of design we needed to make the retail work and that we didn't have the right of way for bike lanes, I started to look at what are the alternatives. And Phelps, you know, immediately stuck out as an alternative. And so I thought, well, what about a pedestrian bicycle bridge? Because a lot of communities are building them, you can actually get some grant money to you know, do like that, like the bicycle facilities. And initially, anyway, um, you could build a, a, a wooden structure, which would be a lot cheaper to build than a full road bridge. And you could build that bicycle um, pedestrian bridge, you know, like 10 feet wide, 12 feet wide, wood to one side of the Phelps Avenue road pavement. So later on, you can keep that uh, bike ped bridge to the side as you then build you know, a, a road bridge there. 
So that that's a, you know well, a great idea. That was my sort of simple way of improving yeah. that pedestrian. I'd right. like to see that idea meld into this plan at some point so that it doesn't get forgotten, because it uh, I think that that's going to need to happen sooner than sooner than than later. It's just yeah. too bad there isn't a, a railroad that we could be turned into that to to <laughs> something. Rails it's too bad trails. we don't have that. Rails and trails. Yeah. It's really close to here. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. anything else, Janet? Before I want to go over to Bill here. Um, no, I think I'm good right yeah, there. Thank you, uh, Bill. You go well, ahead. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any more comments? Oh yes, yeah, Steve. Does. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, just a quick comment. The same thing, uh, Janet. You talk about the widening of Terry Street. I remember the uh, half a million dollars that we got for Hickory Boulevard to widen that, and it was like. Oh, this should never happen. This should never happen. This should never happen. Now everybody's very, very pleased it happened. The, my, my comment to you is that I am so impressed with the design. I am so impressed with the seeking of community input, and I'm so impressed with the city staff and and uh, your group and working together. Uh, I really feel good about it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, one of these days, I want to talk to you. You were from Australia. You went worked in Australia, correct? Yeah, I, I was born I, born <laughs> born in <laughs> Melbourne. Okay, Melbourne, okay, I was in Sydney and I was in Brisbane, and I want to talk to you about the Gold Coast after. Okay, about okay. Roundabout up there, that's all. Right. You I, guys go get a beer afterwards, all right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Bill, what do you got for us? I, I would just like to make the motion to approve the 60% and direct right construction to develop the guaranteed maximum price for the downtown project based on the 60% design as approved by council. There's a motion, is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second. Any other discussion? No. Yes. Yeah. I, I, again, I just want to make sure that we're going to work with all the businesses, mm -hmm. Shangri-La, everybody, just to make sure that we take care of the existing businesses. Yeah. I think we all agree, right? Just, Absolutely. Just to good. Just good. point, I, I did talk with some Shangri-La people today. I'll do a, uh, whatever it is. But they have some ideas, and it's they've been talking about how to do it and make it work. So, Good. Good. Uh, that's everything. Uh, let's have roll call. Councilwoman Martin. Aye. Councilman Slack. Aye. Mayor Nelson. Aye. Councilman Simmons. Aye. Councilman Gibson. No. Councilman Longcart. Aye. Councilman McIntosh. Aye. I'm going to tell you something. This is the time. This is the moment. This is the project. This is the decision that has eluded this community for 40 years. Congratulations. Well done. Well done, you guys. Uh, Council, do you want to take a short recess? Uh, let's take a short 10-minute recess. Uh, uh, let's all be back here about five after eight. Thank you very much.